get with professionals that understand marketing, understand lead generation, understand conversion, understand all of this stuff and ask them with an open mind, what do, what do the best franchisors do out there to help their franchisees generate leads, close leads and, and increase revenue when it comes to marketing? Because you know, as well as I do, franchisors can lock down their websites, they can lock up social media, they can lock up so many things, and that's not necessarily the best thing for the brand. So no matter what you decide as a franchisor to do with that information, go into it with an open mind to see what the best franchisors are doing to help their franchisees. Welcome to the Art of Franchise Marketing. Each episode takes a deep dive into the franchise space and explores how the biggest and best brands handle national branding, franchise development, employee recruitment, and localized marketing on a daily basis. This podcast is brought to you by NetServe, a localized digital marketing partner for franchise networks. NetServe's Madeline Park talks shop with franchise executives to discuss what's working, what's not, and answers the question, what else can you be doing to excel at the art of franchise marketing? Hey everyone, welcome back to the Art of Franchise Marketing. Today we've got a, a veteran on here, and I mean a veteran in the franchise space, Eric Van Horn, who's the, I don't even want to give you a title, I'm going to let you do that because I feel like you've worn every hat in there there is in the franchise space. Right now you're the founder of Front Street Equity Partners, um, but there's a little, there's much more to that than just what they might hear in equity. So Eric, thanks for joining us and, you know, tell us who you are, give us the spiel, the whole, the whole nine yards. Because if you go to his LinkedIn, I mean, there's not enough time in the day to scroll through the experience. So they'll hear it here. <laughs> Maddie, so good to be here. And um, gosh, yeah, where, where do I start? I feel like everything that I've done in franchising has led up to this point with Front Street Equity Partners and how we're helping uh, franchisors right now. But gosh, I don't know, man. If you, I'm a, I'm a uh, husband and a father to my wife and my three daughters. They're getting ready for a birthday party up there. They're nine, 11 and 13. And it's like decorated in horses. And I live on this 80 acre ranch that borders forest service. And, you know, I just live this very simple life in the middle of nowhere in Spearfish, South Dakota town of like 10,000 people. And, uh, I, that's my life here. But then outside of like my, my life has been franchising. And that's how everyone outside of this little town knows me as the franchise guy. Um, I've been a franchisee, franchise or franchise consultant, done a lot in franchise development. I've, I've done a lot in marketing. Marketing has been an interest from my first brand that I was a franchisee with. Um, I, I can go deeper into, into any of that, but uh, that's like the, the overview. So, and usually people like yourself, they, they don't need to name drop, but can you just name drop some of the brands that you've been a part of? So people have an idea of the level of franchise experience we're talking about. I mean, we're not talking about like, you know, the next door cupcakes here. <laughs> I've been uh, like early on as a franchisee with Liberty Tax Service, and that's where I started to understand and learn franchise development and got mentored in franchise development for, for about eight years with that brand as an area developer as well. Area developer back then, now known more as area rep or a master franchise. And so I took the Austin market from four locations when I bought that to 42 locations when I eventually sold that back to the parent company and then went on to other brands, um, Amazing Lash Studio, Solo Salon Studios, a home care company and, you know, um, franchises like that. And mostly as an area developer and a franchisee, most everything was passive or in partnerships that I've been a part of mm -hmm. um, and had a really nice exit out of a uh, Sola when we had 12 locations that we built out over five years in a partnership group with four of us. And we sold that to private equity when they, when Sola went through its first round of an exit to that private equity company. So that was a fun, interesting experience being a franchisee selling to private equity. 
Um, all in that time, I was either doing consulting, like as a, a I was a broker or consultant with Franchise, and then mm -hmm. I was always helping with franchise development because that's re really um, my roots in franchising is in Fran Dev. Um, so I was doing that all along. Started um, Mighty Dog Roofing and Horsepower Brands. Um, exited out of that um, after about a year, year and a half uh, to focus on other things. And that's when Front Street uh, was really born. And uh, me and my, uh, I've got three other business partners in that. And, um, and that's really everything that when we were starting Front Street, we were like saying, what do we want to do? How, what, and what more importantly, kind of what don't we want to do? And I've learned over the years to get crystal clear on the things that I don't want to do. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I didn't want to do was franchise development because I've done so much of that. I didn't want to be on the phone. I stopped, for, I stopped consulting because I didn't want to be on the phone all the time. Yeah. So I said, I told Jeff, I'm like, I could do friend dev and you could do friend dev and we could crush it, but I don't want to do that anymore. And there's probably people that are better and more, uh, more passionate about it than we are today. And then sure. we started to think like, who would that be? And um, eventually Bobby Brennan uh, came over and, um, and became a, a, an equal partner with uh, me, Jeff and Jim over at Front Street. And he heads up the whole franchise development division for Front Street and, and works with all of our brands. But that came about because uh, Jeff and I got really clear on what we didn't want to do, even though we could do it, it didn't bring us energy. And I think we're all at the stage in our lives over at Front Street where we want to be energized by what we do when we're working because we don't have to work hard anymore. None of us do, but we want to have an impact and, and love the game of business. And, um, and so we get to do everything that we want really and nothing that we don't want at Front Street and help a bunch of brands. So that's a, uh, that was, that's an answer to the question, like what brands were you involved with? So I got a little yeah. longer on it. No, I love it. And I think that, you know, if, if anyone takes anything away from this, it would be, you know, that instead of what do you want to do, what don't you want to do? And I resonate with that because when I was trying to figure out what I wanted to major in in college and granted, I basically was like, I'm majoring in basketball. Like I went scholarship. That's what I was doing. My dad printed out every major in America and he, I started on one end and I'm at this big like photo printer paper. He started on the other, he gave me a Sharpie and said, start X and shit off. And he was like, doctor, you can't do blood accounting. You suck at math. So, you know, eventually we targeted it down to communications and, and marketing. And obviously that was a very good way to do it, but you know, it's, it's a definitely a, a much easier way instead of, you know, presenting with, the world is your oyster kind of, you know, eliminating things and then targeting from there. Now with front street, you know, I, I want to get into what you guys are doing there because I, they, I think there's a big misconception in the space. A lot of people think private equity, these big roar capital Riverside, scary looming, you know, trillion gajillion dollar companies that come in and gobble you up and, you know, spit you out or flip you. Um, but there's a lot of uh, opportunity with, you know, smaller firms with people like yourself that that are just that they're people partners, not just this equity symbolism. So talk to me a little bit about what exactly you guys do, what you're what you do with the brands and your ultimate goal. So uh, we will start with kind of what we're not. We're yeah. not like some of these private equity groups. Mm -hmm. We are not like a family of brands. Uh, so we don't just inject money and, and then, um, and then kind of sit in ivory tower and let the brands, you know, grow. Um, and I'm not saying that's what other people do, but that's not what we, that's not what we do. Sure. Um, we will inject capital as the brand needs it or if they need it. Um, so there's, so there's equity injection, um, a capital injection for equity if that's mm -hmm. needed. But really what we are at the end of the day, there's four of us. Um, we've got an, uh, a number of pillars that we really focus on. But what we do is we help young brands. Maybe they have zero franchisees today, or maybe they have 50 franchisees or less than 100. And they, um, they, they want help going to that next level, whatever that looks like. Mm -hmm. They've not experienced an exit. They've not exited a private equity. They not, they've not had like a 
uh, recapitalization. They have not sucked out. Uh, they've not had debt come in and give them some capital back. Like these are founders that are still in the thick of it. And they know that there's light at the end of the tunnel, but they don't exactly know how to get there. Or they've made mistakes along the way. They've awarded franchise uh, franchisees with way too big of territories. Um, agreements that don't make a whole lot of sense. They've just done so many things wrong. And they're thinking if we want to have some of these big exits, like what we all hear about, then they know that they need somebody who's been there, done that before. And that's really where we come in as strategic advisors. Think of us as, as a group of advisors that come alongside the brand and the brand retains all of their um, equity. We don't require um, retainers, so we're not sucking out cash out of that brand. We are there to be side by side with them and help them grow that brand and protect that brand as the enterprise value increases. So um, we get our hands dirty with these brands. If it's, if it's working on that item 19 where they have a very weak item 19 or no item 19 or it's just not that good, Jeff is a, is a master at building out a very robust item 19 and working with the attorneys and getting all the numbers together. Do we have an item 19 that protects the brand because they're mm -hmm. disclosing a lot of information and helps franchisees that are thinking about buying that brand understand the financial model because it's a, it's a clear item 19 and it, and it provides a lot of insight into the prospective buyers. Um, so like we get our hands dirty and that side of things. Um, sometimes a brand needs fractional help. You know, um, they don't have money for a full-time CMO or COO. And I just got mm -hmm. a text today. One of our brands said uh, they just hired one of the C uh, fractional COOs that we, um, that we recommended. So we have a bench of fractional C-level talent that mm -hmm. is ready to go to any one of our brands and we want to be strategic on getting the right fractional C-level talent into the right brand at the right time. Um, we also help these brands, just talent acquisition in general. Um, and some of that's just from my network and my reach and my influence out there and this list that I've built of, of people that work at all these different brands and yet they want to know what's going on and what other opportunities might be out there. So I've got this, this internal list of great uh, C-level and director level uh, employees at different franchise brands. I just sent an email or put a post out on social. It says, hey, one of my brands is looking for something and I put out the job description and I get flooded with, with candidates and then I can um, go through that and, and narrow down three candidates for the founder to to really see who they want who would be a good fit to take them to the next next level and one of our brands is um, put an offer letter out today for a, uh, a, a senior vice president of marketing that is amazing for this for this brand so that's um, what I just mentioned is some of the boots on the ground how we help our our portfolio brands um, and we call that strategic advisory. Like we, uh, we either have been through what they're going through, or we know somebody that is about ready to go, that has gone through what a brand is going to go through. We just like get in the trenches and help them grow that brand in a really smart way that there's a really nice payday, you know, three to five years later, if they want. And I think that's important too. Some founders may not want to sell. And that's okay with us. With the way that we structure um, our our uh, our deals with each of these brands is different with all of them because um, it needs to be tailored to the particular brand and and their goals. So anyway, to sum all that up, we help increase enterprise value um, and collapse timeframes uh, for these brands. So you know, a lot of times when I talk to brands, they fear no matter you know small, big advisory, whatever, a lot of times these brands are their babies. And I'm sure you come across, you know, people being protective and territorial and not knowing, even if they arms wide open, not knowing when to delegate, when to let go. Um, how do you approach that from, you know, the front street end of things where you're coming in, you have experience, but at the same time, you know, there is a delicate balance between you know, being a franchisor of a franchisor and, you know, also letting them be their own business owner and, and, you know, guiding them to make the right decisions, but you have skin in the game. So, you know, at the same time, you can't just let them, 
you know, fall on their face. <laughs> Contractually, they can fall on their face. Contractually, we have no authority to make them do anything. Relationally, okay. we have a lot of relationship capital built up with, with these yeah. brands. And so I think that's another thing that's very different than us um, with a typical private equity or family of brands. Um, as advisors, we can advise uh, and we can give all the reasons why and help them. But at the end of the mm -hmm. day, it's their decision. It's their decision to approve the franchisees that come on board. It's their de it's, everything's their decision. We are there to give them options and to give them um, possible scenarios based on the options that they choose. Uh, because you're right, uh, like, I don't know, I think all founders, it's their baby and they all kind of yeah. treat it differently. But all of a sudden, if you see um, uh, results speak for themselves and sometimes like their plan to hire somebody that may not be that great in uh, the work product shows it's not that great. And then you show them what great looks like and then they're like, then they experience that they're, they're, they're amazed and they want more of that. And so they're going to listen more. And, um, mm -hmm. so I just think, you know, the things that we say are probably going to happen and then that starts to happen. There's just more trust that's built between us and, and the founders. Um, and, and everything that we do, we just want to be aligned strategically with that brand. Um, you know, it goes into franchise development. Like, you know, we have, basically an outsourced FSO for our brands. If they want to use it, they can. Our brands today all use that. That's what Bobby Brennan uh, heads up. Where we are aligned with a brand differently than a typical FSO is these franchisees that are sold, like we want them to be successful. We want them to be the right type of person for that brand because we are going to be living with them as well. We're going to be, you know, our payday at the end of everything, when that brand eventually exits is based on how well that healthy that brand is. And so we're very much aligned to build a healthy brand with healthy franchisees and learning from all of our mistakes. We've all make mistakes. And you know, the four of us have seen probably just about every mistake that can be made in franchising, whether we've seen it, we've made it, or we've heard about it. And we know people that have made those mistakes. We want to use all of that to help our, our brands not you know, fall into that same trap. And there's so many little traps and there's so many things where franchisors think they're doing the right thing, but they're actually hurting their franchisees by trying to do the right thing. And so we just have open, frank conversations with our founders. And, and that's why it's important to get with the right founder. We were talking earlier, like how I have calls with founders all the time. And um, it's super important for us to know that founder, understand that founder and how um, like we want to have dinner with that founder and we want to be able to go on vacation with that founder. We want to have that, that type of relationship. If it's contentious from the beginning, going through contract negotiations with them or just as how they deal with things, we, we don't want to have anything to do with that founder because it, that's, yeah. it's not going to be fun for us and it's not going to be a really good working relationship. So that founder um, in addition to all the other things that have to be right for us, that founder has to be an amazing founder on many levels for us to uh, engage with them and for them to eventually become a portfolio brand with us. You know, and I, I appreciate everything you're saying because it really goes back to the essence of franchising where you are on the equity side of things, which is probably as corporate as you could get in franchising as, as much as it's not corporate. And still there is a lot of, you know, I love this, but Scott Abbott called it the squishy stuff, which is the relationship stuff. And you can't quantify that on a spreadsheet. You can't, you know, strip that or add that um, using a calculator. And I think a lot of people, whether they're only been business owners or they've only been in corporate, they don't quite understand how those pieces put together. I call it relationshiping. So a lot of times, you know, people will be like, well, how many, you know, brands did you close or how many, you know, clients did you bring in? And I'm like, nothing, but I spent 80 hours this week relationshiping. And I can tell you that's going to pay dividends down the road. Um, and unless you're in franchising and at the level we're at, you know, you don't really understand that value. 
um, which is what I talk to a lot of suppliers about when they expect to come in the franchise vertical and make shit ton of money right away because they just see multi-location dollar signs. And I'm like, that is not how it works here, folks. So, you know, you're talking about creating great relationships. You're talking about finding those right founders. What makes you jump out of your seat, not that you ever probably do, but what makes you excited about a brand? You know, you probably have seen every concept to Kingdom Come, but at this point in time, you're at Front Street, the phone rings. What is that, I don't want to say that concept, but what do those founders in that business plan have to have for you to really say, all right, let's let's potentially go on to next steps? One of what it's not. They, if they're not making money, that's a, it's like, it's a no go. It sounds <laughs> like, of course, that's the way it is. But we get on the phone with franchisors that will not put their numbers in the item 19 because mm. they are not making money. They're literally not making money and they are hoping that a franchisee will come in and do better than they're doing. And that's their solution. And, you know, and I'm trying to talk about things that uh, you, like some of us in franchising might not talk about all the time on these podcasts, but that's yeah. a conversation that I had last week with a founder. And the best thing that I could do for that founder is to say, and we told her, you are lucky you don't have any franchisees right now. Like that's the best thing that's happened yeah. to you. You don't have franchisees. Go focus on getting your numbers to where you'd be proud to share them in an item 19, or you know that your franchisees can make money. <clears throat> so um, one that has to make money. Like if these, um, and legit money, not just money to show in an item 19, we've turned down brands that the industry, Franchise industry, FD, in that, let me, let me phrase it a different way. <laughs> there are brands out there today with item 19s in this particular industry that show that they're wildly successful. Yet we had a brand that wanted to, um, and he's an influencer in this industry. He knows the industry well. He does a, a, ton, of, uh, a ton of revenue across multiple, uh, multiple states. And he said, I don't understand how these franchises are making the kind of money that they say they're gonna make. It's not possible in this industry. So we will look at um, what the, the founder says they're making. We will also make sure that like, that's kind of industry standard, that nothing's puffed yeah. up or whatever. Um, so, so we look at things like that. Um, so we want high revenue. So high mm -hmm. revenue um, and, and large margins. Um, because mm -hmm. what we want to do is we want to charge fees to these franchisees, but not just charge fees to them. We want to charge fees so the franchisor has enough revenue coming in to be able to support those franchisees in amazing ways. So sure. we want enough revenue to be able to charge enough fees so those fees come back to the franchise corporation and then they can invest that into things that will get a franchisee a return on those fees, whether it's royalty or marketing or brand or mm -hmm. whatever it is. So that's how we think of it. How can we ROI? Um, uh, how can we help franchisees ROI on that? We're looking at an industry right now. That's one of the hottest industries in franchising. And we see a lot of, a lot of um, holes in some of the brands now that are, that are exploding there. And so mm -hmm. we're thinking, Everything that we are learning today, how can we have a brand, pick the right brand and the right founder so in 2024, we can roll it out and be way better and way better prepared for longevity in this particular industry with a brand. And one of the things is we need to charge more money for research and development. Like the mm -hmm. name of the game in this particular industry is research and development. The brands that we think are going to win are going to be out ahead of all the other brands because they are on the cutting edge of this particular uh, industry. And so when we're talking internally with this founder, we want to make sure that they're on board to charge this type of this type of extra fee, but to actually spend more at the franchise or level to give the franchisees value um, mm -hmm. and return on that fee. Um, so one, the franchise, the brands have to make money. The, 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 um, the founder has to have some money. Like we just can't be the bankroll at all if they don't have the money. And one of the things that we love, like Jeff and I do a lot of these calls together. 
and we're, we're on a call with somebody and they know their numbers, it's a breath of fresh air. Now that's not, mm -hmm. that's not a deal breaker by any means, but you get on with them and they know their numbers, they know their margins, they know their lead um, acquisition costs, they know their all, you know, all these big numbers that they really should know if they were going on to Shark Tank or something, if they know that right. like, wow, this is, this is great. Um, mm -hmm. so like that's, that's, uh, and they're not afraid to spend money. They're not afraid to have delayed gratification. They know, mm -hmm. they understand getting into franchising as a franchisor is not the quick cash flow, uh, play it's it, you're playing for an exit. You're, you're, it's a longer term investing into the business so you can, uh, so you can have a better, bigger, bigger, better payday, uh, years down the mm -hmm. road. And um, I would say the last thing is we, we try to talk them out of like growing fast. We try to talk them out of, you know, all of those things that um, even like growing at all as a franchise or so um, mm -hmm. if they're not a franchise yet, we push back. Like Jeff always says, the first rule of franchising is don't franchise because it comes <laughs> with all of this ch challenging stuff. If you're not made for that, it's going to crush you. Um, yeah. so those are some of the things that we look for. We're always looking out in, uh, in different industries. We got, um, we talked to different private equity companies consistently mm -hmm. to see what do they see as the, in the next three to five years, what are they interested in and why mm -hmm. are they interested in it? And what do they see as slowing down and why is it slowing down? So, um, and then one last thing, I just got so many things going through my head. Um, Love it. a lot of what we do is we will go into the broker networks at first with the mm -hmm. brand. Um, and, and, and we think they're probably going to be weighted more towards broker leads early on. Part of it's because we have such good relationship with like all the right. broker networks and the, and the, and the, and the specific brokers and consultants at these networks. So we can really get in there and, and see some impact. Um, but so that's, that's some, uh, we think, you start out with the broker networks and that's how you can get a decent amount of franchisees early on and quality franchisees. But at some point that flips and then you can have more organic after you get, you get a good base of franchisees. Sure. And so we want to make sure that brands are understand that model because it's challenging and it's expensive, mm -hmm. but um, if they can understand that you're not making money off of franchise fees and you, and franchise fees are what, are the cost to get a franchisee and um and you're really making money downstream once the uh franchisees are up and going and successful if they understand all that and they're still excited to talk to us uh <laughs> and they're still in the right industry we want to talk we want to keep keep talking to that brand so uh you know i didn't want to stop your role mid mid uh mid question but i do mid have rolling. a I had a, I have a question for you and I didn't know how to answer this and it's very rare that, well, I don't want to say it, it's very rare. I didn't know how to answer it, but I just didn't know what to say. I have this franchise and it's an a established brand and they are not the leader in the industry by any means, but they are probably two or three. It's a smaller industry. It's in the kind of health and wellness space. And they inherited, so as a CEO, they inherited the brand that was initially area developers and they're trying to move away from that. But the problem is when I was talking to him about Fran Dev is that they have a terrible item 19. He's like, I know we have a terrible item 19. I still have to meet these franchise development goals. Do I publish it with a bad item 19 or do I not publish it? And I mean, I think you can speak to both sides of it. I mean, I think, yeah, sure, you publish it with the idea of that you can speak to it. And then if you don't publish it, that's also an immediate kind of red flag. And so for a brand that's already 50 to 100 locations with a poor item 19 because of whatever, what would your advice be to them to turn that around? Because ideally you want your franchisees to make money so you can you know, turn your item 19 around, but you know, on an annual basis, that might not be a quick process. So what would your response be to that? My first question back to them would be, how are your new stores opening? Mm -hmm. What, what kind of, how are they, how are they doing? And if they're doing way better than what would be published in the item 19, I probably wouldn't put old information. That's not very good information in that item 19. 
because right. it's not reflecting on what's actually happening. So I, um, so I probably wouldn't put in inaccurate, especially if it's bad, inaccurate, bad information, because it's not going to be good if it's showing a little bit of money uh, mm -hmm. versus making a lot of, a lot of money. Um, but I would start to understand how the new stores are, are doing and what they've done to change that. And I would probably have that be the narrative in the whole Fran Dev process. Like, and I would probably say, you know, separate it out, like have a clear, uh, uh, a clear marker. These are version ones and these are version twos. Mm -hmm. And these are the differences between version one and version two. And, uh, and that way when franchisees are validating, uh, prospective franchisees are validating, they can clearly understand, is this a version one person or a version two? And, um, and then you just kind of, you know, uh, uh, go from there. But I think that's probably what I would do. Now, if they are not making any money, nothing's changed, um, then I would probably put in some indicators in that item 19 of whatever it is that would be helpful to a buyer, but mm -hmm. probably not publish a bunch of information that's really going to kill a sale, but something that is going to be helpful to, uh, to, the, to these uh, buyers out there, whether it's gross revenue or it's mm -hmm. uh, certain margins on things or whatever it is, I would try to do, try to do something. But beyond all of that, if we're talking to that brand from our perspective at Front Street, it's how do you get your locations to open up with twice the amount of revenue, better, mm -hmm. bet, you know, a, a much faster cash flow break even. So those are the conversations that we would be, we would be having with them. And those are the questions that we ask, like, what would it take for you to double your revenue in a location? Like, what would that take? How would you do that? And sometimes they're just like, it's not possible. Um, and sometimes it's like, well, this is what I would do. And this is how I would do it. But I think that brand, if, if they are not making, if these franchisees are not doing very well, and yeah. that's a lot of franchises out there, like mm -hmm. that's not uncommon. And then it's like, let's pause franchise development you know, we don't have to officially pause it, but let's just not focus on franchise development and put a ton of focus into uh, re uh, increases year over year. We even talk to our founders about that all the time. What are we doing to have your sales increase this year? And, and how are we going to do that? And so when we talk about in the trenches with our, with our founders, it's not just like, hey, how do we sell more franchises? It's like your locations need to, need to be, you know, the best. And how do you increase, increase sales year over year? So I don't know. I don't know if that's the right answer, but. No, it's helpful. Cause I was, you know, that mean that she was too stunned to speak. I was like, ah, well, I don't want you to get fired, but I also don't really want you to sell franchises with that data because, yeah. you know, also, you know, we, we talked about, I don't want to say, well, maybe rose colored glasses data where the franchisor says, this is how much you can make. And in, in so many words, right. Without, you know, violating oh. legal. Um, and you know, we've had pro, pro, pro formas in the brands I own that I'm like, hell yeah, we'll buy into this. And they were, I was bamboozled Eric by how off they were. Like we have one of our franchises and everyone knows I'm just, I'm a clear door here. Like there is no secrets that one of our franchises and it's not the newer one. It's one of the established ones that is just a money hole. It is a money pit and we are year four and it is supposed to be turning a profit. It is international. Like this is a big brand and it's not made pro also. And you know, it, <laughs> yeah, it's process of elimination. Process now of elimination. everybody knows what it is. Trend here, but <laughs> we were just shocked by how, off a franchisor could be. So what is your advice to franchisors who say, I, I want to sell and I believe that it could do this well, but at the same time, you might have offices closing, they're not doing so well. How do they bridge that gap between, I'm not, I don't want to pause for Dev. I have enough franchisees doing well, they might not be doing what my nice little rose colored spreadsheet does. But at the same time, I also got a handful over here that are you know, closing doors. So what, how do you bridge that gap? Especially if you're a franchisor that has hundreds of locations. It's easy for franchisors to start blaming everything on the franchisees. Yes. And a lot of times it is the franchisees, right? But it's not always the case. And sometimes 
their the franchisors contributed to to some of these franchisees not doing very well. Mm -hmm. um, I think also if the majority of the franchisees are making money, that's good. Or if that the majority aren't at bleeding money, that's good. And if there are, let's say, you know, a third or twenty five percent that are doing really well, I think that would give confidence to the franchise or to to continue on and focus and to see why are those why are they doing well and to find more people like them. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't. I yeah. If you have a, a good group that's doing well, I wouldn't. I wouldn't pause it, um, Fran Dev, and I would. Um, I just probably just have an accurate item nineteen. Um, with act, you know, it doesn't have to be item 19s don't have to be like, this is how much revenue it is. And this is how much profit you'll do. Like there's so many different things that you can put in as benchmarks and, and KPIs into those item 19s that are, that are helpful. And then fr prospective franchisees can go and talk to all these different franchisees out there. And they talk to the ones that are not doing very well. And they talk to the ones that are doing great. And it's their decision at that point to, um, and they're going to lose some sales because people, people don't buy most of the time because they get fearful and that's why they don't buy. And you'll probably lose some good franchisees because they get fearful and they just won't pull the trigger. But at the mm -hmm. end of the day, you'll probably get a better group of franchisees that have, uh, that have done a good amount of due diligence and they've made a very well informed decision with a lot of good information and a lot of validation. And because of that, they're probably going to be able to weather the storm and, and, and stick around and make better decisions and become a better franchisee because of it. I don't know. You know I, I love that advice. And it's, you know, you're not, don't be scared to lose a sale, even if it is a good franchisee. I hear a lot of people say you, you have to say no to the wrong franchisee, but honestly, Eric, you're the first person that ever said it's okay to lose or say no and maybe miss shot on a good franchisee. I mean, that's what's going to happen. But collectively, you're going to have, you know, a better, like you said, a better group of franchisees because of it. And if we were any other franchisee, new or didn't have pre-established relationships, we would have shut the doors two years ago and said, you know, enough of this. But we're well capitalized enough and have been through the ringer enough to say, ah, all right, well, we're in this far. Let's just keep going and see what happens. Um, but no, I, you know, I love that. And uh, we're coming up on time soon. And my final kind of talking point to you is you're talking a lot about validations and oftentimes franchisors new big small they lose sight of how important validations are in the process they just feel it's another step they really are focusing on where the leads are coming from maybe it's brokers maybe it's fs whatever it is um can you talk to me about how you at front street and just you as a franchise professional approach validations, because I think a lot of franchisors only give you the top 10. I mean, for made pro, we're one of the top five made pros. We get validation calls all the time. I'm like, did you only give out my number? I mean, it's fine, but like, like we end up giving out, you know, a whole list because we want everyone to talk to not just us, but the whole roundabout. So how do you approach that? Especially with maybe emerging brands that are trying to grow and they don't, they might not have anyone that can validate. That's why you need to have an item 19. Like if you don't have an item 19, you don't have like really that anybody in retail, you don't have anybody that can validate for a while until these things get up and right. going. And then you don't have right. anything to validate until they've been open for a period of time. If you have a really good salesperson, a good FSO or a really good Fran Dev person, you can sell a ton of franchises with, uh, you know, doing it that way. But I would have, a, you know, you gotta have an item 19 to, 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 to help with, if you're an emerging brand mm -hmm. like that. Our, we have an emerging brand that had zero, it's called GoGlo, zero uh, franchisees. Um, first franchisee and a good robust um, accurate uh, <laughs> item 19 that is you know, these item 19s can be accurate factually but very inaccurate in terms of the picture that it paints mm -hmm. um, because of the way you can slice and dice these numbers so I would I'm proud to say this item 19 is accurate on all fronts um, our first franchisee was a uh, former European wax owner which is a great brand and then a current MySalon suite owner 
And so um, they had zero validation, but they had enough information in item 19 and they can go into the location and actually see what's happening with their own eyes. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, that was our, our advice is robust item 19 and then, you know, be an open book when people are in the location and looking, they can see, oh, this is how many people are working. This is what it's like on this type of day and, and all of that type of data. Um, um, I forgot the rest of the question. Just, you, you know, the, impor the importance of validations. So as you get, as you grow, and validation is like incredibly important. I'm always talking about it. And I like to talk about it on podcasts like this and information that I put out because mm -hmm. that, that way when franchisees go to validate, they know what I say is what I would, I'm not just telling them that in that particular moment. So in other words, like talking to underperformers. Yeah, you talk to some underperformers, but that's not where I'm spending the majority of my time because they can be underperforming for a lot of different reasons, but you're gonna get a lot of emotion when you're talking to underperformers of why they are underperforming. And it's usually never their fault. It's all the franchisor's fault. And that may or may not be true, but you're really not going to get the truth um, until you, um, you're probably just not gonna get the real truth from them. Mm -hmm. Middle of the road, I, I like talking to them to understand um, when I say I like talking to them, I like, I, I like, um, franchisors understand you want, uh, you want your franchisees to I'm trying to wear different hats right now as a franchisor, you want your franchisees to understand the importance of validation. So they place the value helping prospective franchisees understand the opportunity because it's easy for franchisees to forget once they're going and how they, um, um, how they had to go through that at some point. So you got right. these franchise, franch help your franchisees understand the importance of validation. And then um, we do recorded calls with them. There's, you have to be careful with some of this. There's all nuances, what's legal, what's not legal. So franchisors get with your attorney to find out what you can do, what you can't do, and all the little little things that that, uh, that go along with that. But recorded validation calls where it's recorded, the franchisees are on there with prospective franchisees. And um, and I don't believe that any of the of the staff are on there at the franchise or level, but it's recorded. And then mm -hmm. um, and then people can ask questions in that group setting. I've seen that uh, I've seen that work. And then you have to post I believe you have to post all of those or make them all available. So you can't pick and choose. Oh, this is a really good one. This is a really bad one. We better bury this one and keep the other ones. Um, um, so, you know, those are, those are some of the, some of the things that make it easier for all these franchise prospective franchisees to really, um, uh, validate. Um, mm -hmm. and then I think, uh, if I'm validating as a franchise E, you just, as a prospective franchisee, you need to really dig in and ask why on all kinds of things. It's so easy on these calls, a uh, group call, individual call for a franchisee to say, for somebody to say, how much money, how much revenue did you do? A million dollars. How much money did you make? $200,000. Would you do it again? Yes. It's like, okay, check. That's done. Well, what they didn't ask is, um, are you an anomaly? Like, is this normal? Does everybody make $200,000 and a million dollars? And the right. answer might be yes, but it might be no. <laughs> Nobody else does this. I'm the only one. Or maybe it's no, and then it's why. And, and I was talking to somebody the other day that's like, did, I did amazing. I, broke, I made a couple hundred thousand dollars out of my first year as a franchisee. And, and I want to, you know, uh, but the reason is cause I'm in a restoration business and we had a huge storm come through. And so we had all of this business and we couldn't help, but make a bunch of money or right. in the salon suite business. Uh, if someone was to validate with me back then uh, they would, and, and if I was still around today, did you make money? Did you, when were you cash flow break even Oh, month one to three cash flow break even? Oh, that's great. And you know, and did you make money? Yeah. Made, made good money my first year. Would you do it again? Yes, I would do it again. That, that was all true. But what's also true if I was validating that today um, is I got rent at extremely uh, under market uh, mm -hmm. rents because I bought, I, I got long-term leases signed 
out of the last recession. So you can't get those rents, even where close to those rents anymore. Mm -hmm. So it's things like that, that I think franch prospective franchise buyers need to understand or um, franchisors need to help educate their franchisees on how to validate, not like tell them what to say, but help them understand what the prospect's really asking. One last thing on this is, uh, this is a, a good example for franchisors. Um, if somebody could uh, call up and validate with the franchisee and say, hey, how much money, how, what was your revenue? A million dollars, how much money did you make? Zero, I'm not making any money. And um, is that true in that franchisee's mind? 100% true. But what's also true that what they didn't tell this person is that they are making, uh, they are drawing $300,000 of wages out themselves as the owners. Right. And so that never really comes up. And so in the candidate's mind, they're not making any money and, um, and, and that's it. So franchise, I think the biggest thing that franchisors are missing in validation is helping their franchisees understand where the money is going. Help the franchisees understand the PL, the cash flow statements, the health of the business, all of that. Because if the franchisors can help the franchisees understand all of that, I think you'll have more accurate and better validation. I love that, Eric. I appreciate every piece of advice you've shared with us. I think that that's one of the reasons we get along so well is we're just willing to listen, give, and you know, have a good time while doing it. So, you know, we're up on time. I said, oh, this will take 25 minutes, not 45 minutes later. I'm like, oh, can you go another three hours? Um, what is next for Eric and Front Street Partners? Um, we got some really cool things that I can't announce yet for Front Street that will be happening in 2024. We are going to be doing some big things that are going to help franchisors on the exit of their brands. Um, mm -hmm. So we got another pillar that we'll be introducing with uh, some pretty amazing people. Um, that will be something that nobody else is is doing under one kind of a uh, house like what we have at Front Street. So that's really exciting. We have more brands that uh, that are coming on board and some really cool, fun ones. And um, so we just want to keep growing and uh, keep having fun and being energized and in talking to the brands and helping the brands that we talk to. So more of the same and uh, and some cool things that um, will be another pillar in uh, in our in our company that um, that we'll be able to share sometime next year. Um, but yeah, it's it's going to be so fun. <laughs> and you know what makes it great is you're not doing anything you don't want to do. <laughs> That's exactly <laughs> because you made it. that conscious decision. Um, and you know, usually I would just end it there because you've already dropped so much advice, but I'm just gonna soak you like a sponge. So last piece of, uh, last question is if you had one piece, one blanket piece of advice to give to a franchisor, what would that be? And if you had a blanket piece of advice to give to a franchisee, what would that be? Oh man. We've heard um... anywhere from don't do it, run. <laughs> Franchisees, uh, network with the top performers, whatever it takes, network with the top performers, go visit their locations, get to know them, put together a, a, a once a month call where you bring all the top performers together and you are the biggest underperformer, the newest person there. But if you can be the person that brings everybody together and facilitates that, you will learn so much from them. Resist the uh resist the middle and the bottom performers tendencies to want to blame everything on the franchise or i would lean in the other way and say that might all be true the franchise or is doing all of this big bad stuff that might be true but what can i control and how do i fix the things that i can control um mm -hmm. so and i trust me i've been on both sides of this i've been a part of franchisors who are not very good and they will remain <laughs> nameless so I'm not saying this as, with a franchisor hat on. I'm saying this with a franchisee hat on. Mm -hmm. Franchisors, I would get obsessed with helping franchisees with their marketing and helping them understand the business of business, how to become a better business owner, how to, how to um, uh, just everything that it takes to be a better business owner, understanding financials, being a great boss, leadership, all of the stuff that a normal, a small business owner out there would get and have access to, I would give that to them, but I would also um, 
at the franchisor level, you have the opportunity to lock down things that they really need to have access to, to have better marketing, to have better, better websites, better all of this stuff. So I would get with professionals that understand marketing, understand lead generation, understand conversion, understand all of this stuff and ask them with an open mind, what do, what do the best franchisors do out there to help their franchisees generate leads, close leads and, and increase revenue when it comes to marketing? Because you know as well as I do, franchisors can lock down their websites, they can lock up social media, they can lock up so many things, and that's not necessarily the best thing for the brand. So no matter what you decide as a franchisor to do with that information, go into it with an open mind to see what the best franchisors are doing to help their franchisees. I love that. Eric, thank you so much for coming on. If you guys wanna connect with him, you can check out Eric, Eric Van Horn on LinkedIn. Contact me. I'll connect you. And he's got, you know, his podcast. He's got Franchise Secrets by Eric Van Horn Facebook group that you can request to be a part of um, and a million things in between. So we look forward to uh, watching you grow and seeing what's on the horizon for 2024. Thank you so much for having me on. I love what you are doing for the franchise community out there. I'm glad to be just a little piece of what you're doing, but, um, but I absolutely love it. So thank you for all that you do. Thanks, Eric. Thanks for listening to The Art of Franchise Marketing. This show is brought to you by NetSertive. We help franchise brands and multi-location businesses run localized digital marketing at scale. To learn more, visit netsertive.com.